been in a no shit war zone, then you're sitting in a plush chair, looking up at a little nozzle, shooting air conditioning, thinking, what the fuck? You've got a rifle between your knees, and so does everyone else. Some Marines got M9 pistols. If they take away your bayonets because you aren't allowed to have knives on, a, on an airplane. <laughs> Even though you've showered, you look grimy and lean. Everybody's hollow-eyed and their cameras are beat to shit. And you sit there, you close your eyes, and you think. But the problem is your thoughts don't come out in any kind of straight order. You don't think... Oh, I did A, then B, then C, then D. You, you, you try to think about O, and then you're in the torture house. You see the body parts in the locker, and the retarded guy in the cage. He squawked like a chicken. His, his head was shrunk down to a coconut. It takes you a while to remember Doc saying they'd shot mercury into his skull. And then it still wouldn't make any sense. You see things you saw the times you nearly died. Broken television, a haji corpse, eye halts covered in blood, lieutenant on the radio. You see the little girl, the photographs Curtis found in the desk. First had a, had a beautiful Iraqi kid, maybe seven or eight years old. Bare feet, pretty white dress like it's First Communion. And the next, she's, she's in a red dress, high heels, heavy makeup. Next photo, same dress, but her face is smudged. She's holding a gun to her head. I try to think of other things, like, like my wife, Cheryl. Pale skin, fine dark hairs on her arms. She's ashamed of them. They're soft, delicate. I've been thinking of Cheryl made me feel guilty. But I think about Lance Corporal Hernandez, Corporal Smith, and Eichholz. We were like brothers, Eichholz and me. Two of us saved this Marine's life one time. A few weeks later, Ike Holtz is climbing over a wall. The surgeon pops out a window, shoots him in the back, and he's halfway over. So, I'm thinking about that. And I'm seeing the retard, and the girl, and the wall Ike Holtz died on. But here's the thing. I, I'm thinking a lot, and I, and I mean a lot, about those fucking dogs. I'm, I'm thinking about my dog, Vicar. About the shelter we got him from, where Cheryl said we had to get an older dog because nobody takes older dogs. How we could never teach him anything. How he'd throw up shit he shouldn't have eaten in the first place. How he'd slink away, all guilty, tail down and head low, back legs crouched. How his fur started turning gray two years after we got him. He had so many white hairs round his mouth, it looked like a mustache. So there it was. Vicar and Operation Scooby all the way home. Maybe, I, I don't know, you prepared to kill people. You practice on man-shaped targets, so you're ready. Of course, we got targets they call dog targets. Target-shaped delta. But they don't look like fucking dogs. They, and, and, and it's not easy to kill people either. Out of boot camp, the Marines act like they're gonna play Rambo, but it's fucking serious, man. It's professional. Usually, we found we found this one insurgent doing the death rattle, foaming and shaking, fucked up, you know. He's hit with a 7.62 in the chest and pelvic girdle. He'll be gone in a second, but the company XO walks up, 
pulls out his K-bar, slits his throat, says, it's good to kill a man with a knife. So all the Marines look at each other like, what the fuck? Didn't expect that from an XO. That's some PFC bullshit. On the flight, I thought about that too. That's so funny. You're sitting there with your rifle in your hand but no ammo in sight. And then you touch down in Ireland. To refuel. And it's so foggy you can't see shit, but you know, this is Ireland. There's gotta be beer. <laughs> and the plane's captain, a fucking civilian, reads off some message about how general orders stay in effect until you reach the States and you're still considered on duty, so no alcohol. Well, our CO jumped up and said, that makes about as much sense as a goddamn football bat. All right, Marines, you got three hours. I hear they serve Guinness. <laughs> oh, fucking raw. <laughs> Corporal Weezer ordered five beers at once and had them all laid out in front of him. He didn't even drink for a while. Just sat there looking at him. All happy. O'Leary said, look at you, smiling like a faggot in a dick tree. <laughs> Which is a DI expression Curtis loves. So Curtis laughs and says, what a horrible fucking tree. <laughs> and we all start cracking up. Happy just knowing we can get fucked up, let our guard down. We got crazy quick. <laughs> Most of us had lost about 20 pounds. It had been months, seven months since we had a drop of alcohol. McManigan, second to work PFC, was rolling around the bar with his nuts hanging out of his camis, telling Marines, Stop looking at my balls, faggot! <laughs> Lance Corporal Slaughter was there all of a half hour before he puked in the bathroom with Corporal Craig, the sober Mormon, helping him out, and Lance Corporal Greeley, the drunk Mormon, puking in the stall next to him. <laughs> Even the company guns got wrecked. It was good. We got back on the plane and passed the fuck out. Woke up in America. Except when we touched down in Cherry Point, there was nobody there. It was zero dark, cold, and half of us were rocking the first hangover we'd had in months which at that point was a kind of shitty that felt pretty fucking good. <laughs> and we got off the plane, and there was a big empty landing strip, maybe half a dozen red patchers, a bunch of seven tons lined up, no families. Company guns said they were waiting for us at Lejeune. Soon we got the gear loaded on the trucks, the sooner we get to see them. Roger that. Set up working parties. Tossed our rucks and sea bags into the seven tons. Heavy work. Got the blood flowing in the cold. Sweat a little of the alcohol out too. Then they pulled up a bunch of buses and we all got on, packed in. M16 sticking everywhere. Muzzle awareness gun to shit, but that didn't matter. Cherry Point to Lejeune's an hour. First bits through trees. You don't see much in the dark. Not much when you get on 24 either. Stores haven't opened yet. Neon lights off at gas stations and bars. Looking out, I sort of knew where I was, but I didn't feel home. I figured I'd be home when I kiss my wife and pet my dog. We went through Lejeune's side gate, which is about mm, 10 minutes from my battalion area. 15, I told myself, the way this fuck is driving. When we got to McHugh, everyone got a little excited. And then the driver turned on A Street. Battalion area's on A. And I saw the barracks, and I thought, there it is. 
and then they stopped about 400 meters short, right in front of the armory. I, I could have jogged down to where the families were. But I could see that there, there was an area behind one of the barracks where they'd set up lights, and there were cars parked everywhere. I could hear the crowd down the way. The families were there. But we all got in line, thinking about them just down the way. Me, thinking about Cheryl and Vicar. We waited. When I got to the window and handed in my rifle, though, it brought me up short. That was the first time I'd been separated from it in months. I didn't know where to rest my hands. First, I, I put them in my pockets, and, and then I took them out and, and crossed my arms, and, and I just let them hang useless at my sides. After all the rifles were turned in, first sergeant had us get in a no-shit parade formation. We had a fucking guidon waving out front, and we marched down A Street. When we got to the edge of the first barracks, people started cheering. I, I couldn't see them until we turned the corner, and, and then there they were, a big wall of people holding signs under a bunch of outdoor lights, and, and the lights were bright and pointed straight at us, so, so it was hard to look into the crowd and tell who was who. Well, off to the side, there were, there were picnic tables and a marine in woodland grilling hot dogs, and there was a bouncy castle, a fucking bouncy castle. We kept marching. A couple, a couple more Marines and Woodlands were holding the crowd back in a line. And we marched until we were straight alongside the crowd. And then First Sergeant called us to a halt. I saw some TV cameras. There were a lot of, like, a lot of U.S. flags. And the whole McManigan clan was up front, right in the middle, holding a banner that read, Oorah! Private First Class Bradley McManigan! We are so proud. I scanned the crowd back and forth. I, I talked to Cheryl on the phone in Kuwait. Not for very long, just, hey, I'm good. And, yeah, within 48 hours, talk to the FRO. He'll tell you when to be there. And she said she'd be there. But it was strange on the phone. I hadn't heard a voice in a while. Then I saw Eichholz's dad. He had a sign, too. It said, Welcome back, heroes of Bravo Company. I looked right at him and remembered him from when we left. And I thought, that's Eichholz's dad. And that's when they released us. And they released the crowd, too. I was standing still, and the Marines around me, Curtis and O'Leary, McManigan and Craig, and we said, they were rushing out to the crowd, and the crowd was coming forward. Eichholz's dad was coming forward. He was shaking the hand of every Marine he passed. I don't think a lot of guys recognized him, and I knew I should say something, but, but I didn't. I backed off. I looked around for my wife, and I saw my name on the side. Sergeant Price, so. But the rest was blocked by the crowd. I couldn't see who was holding it. And then I was moving toward it, away from Eichholz's dad, who was hugging Curtis. I saw the rest of the sign. It said, Sergeant Price, now you're home, you can do some chores. <laughs> Here's your to-do list. Number one, me. <laughs> number two, repeat number one. <laughs> and there, holding the sign, was Cheryl. <laughs>